The patriarchy has become a powerful feminist watchword for the unequal division of power between men and women. In some fields, though, the tables have turned, with women a third more likely to go to university, three quarters of teachers being women, and the courts predominantly giving women custody of children. Should we be demanding equality for men in these areas? Or are there arenas where equality is a mistaken goal and women should have the upper hand? Now, on the panel, uh, on my right, is um, Joanna Williams. Dr. Joanna Williams is the author of Women vs. Feminism, associate editor of the political magazine Spiked, and head of education and culture at Policy Exchange. Philip Blonde, on my left, is a political philosopher, Anglican theologian, and director of the Race Publica think tank. He's the author of Red Tory, How Left and Right Have Broken Britain, and How We Can Fix It. And join us, joining us uh, on the left of the platform is Elif Sarikan. Uh, she's a Kurdish rights activist. Uh, she's come to the festival shortly after visiting Rojava in northern Syria, where the Kurdish liberation movement has established a unique political system based on direct democracy and which is ideologically feminist. Well, let's start with those first statements for three minutes. And uh, does the patriarchy exist? Joanna Williams, does it, did it? No, yes. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think the patriarchy does exist anymore. I think it's uh, meaningless to talk about patriarchy in society today. And I think you can look at that from two different perspectives. The first is literally in terms of men. Are men dominating positions of power? Are men males um, running society? Are men keeping women uh, in a subservient position in society today? And to me, the answer to all of those questions is no. But I think the patriarchy means something beyond just men and male dominance. Um, I, I think it also can be associated with a distinct set of values. And for me, I think this is the most important shift that's taken place in society over the past two or three decades, where if you think of values that were traditionally associated with a patriarchal society or male dominance, so I'm thinking of things like um, stoicism, stiff upper lip, uh, a kind of emotional strength, uh, almost an aggression, perhaps a competitive competitiveness, um, ambition. I, I don't think these are exclusively male values. I think females can embody these values just as much. I hope I have some of those values. I would aspire to have some of those values. But I think they were uh, a set of values that's traditionally been associated with masculinity, um, traditionally emerged from a patriarchy, if you like. And I think far more even than men being taken out of positions of power and replaced by women, I think we've had a cultural shift and a values shift away from those values where these values are actually seen as being quite negative nowadays. So if you think of the word masculinity, the, the word that's most often used in conjunction with masculinity nowadays is toxic. We talk about toxic masculinity. Um, if you think that having a stiff upper lip um, or being stoical in the face of adversity is good nowadays, then actually you're seen as having a psychological problem that you should probably get counselling for because you're um, not in touch enough with your emotions, you're not um, sensitive enough. And I think the values that dominate in society nowadays um, are far more values that would traditionally be associated with the feminine. So a need to be sensitive, to be caring, um, to not have a stiff upper lip, but to be prepared and happy to talk about your emotions. So I think you can look at patriarchy in two different ways, a tally of males and females, but also I think far more fundamentally a value. And it's that value shift that makes me think that we do not live in a society that's a patriarchy anymore, but actually uh, the opposite. Thanks, Philip Blonde. Uh, does patriarchy exist? Uh, no, uh, I, don't, I don't think it does in, at scale in the West anymore. Did it, uh, perhaps, um, and we can certainly talk about that. <clears throat> what I think we live in now is, is um, quite a much more dangerous world. And <clears throat> the deployment of things like patriarchy or patriarchy is essentially a way of vilifying men to core so that we produce an account that says, basically, if you're white, male, 
heterosexual, you are almost by definition an oppressor, that you have no um, liberating or emancipatory um, ability or outcome. And it's a strange sort of inverted um, uh, fascism, really, against uh, um, one half of, of, uh, of the human race, broadly speaking. And it's deeply problematic because what it advances is um, an insidious liberal feminist project that destroys solidarity. <clears throat> the whole mark of radical politics now is an anti-solidarity project so that we reduce all of our human concerns and all of our wishes uh, for a better life to sectional groups, be they black, be they gay, be they uh, women, and we vilify all other groups and we destroy the idea of common value sets and common solidarity, which alone is the co condition from which we can emancipate all. And this is part, I think, of a genuinely uh, dangerous um, uh, nihilistic come fascist trend in our society that I think will lead to um, very extreme politics of the future. And also I think it's very clear that women, at least in the West, are doing very well and uh, liberal feminism, which is the dominant, though not the only form of feminism, is essentially a way of upper middle class women advancing their high status yet further by, as Joanna argues, rightly in my view, claiming victimhood. And victimhood is the new middle class coinage for self-advancement. And that's the, the point. It's an upper class language game that ignores class and ignores solidarity with, um, with other women who aren't in, uh, in such an advanced class position. So it's somewhat revolting. What we really need and what I'd really advocate for is a radical feminism. And that needs something like a return to essentialism, a recognition that men and women are really different, that they're not the same and that justice isn't about imposing a false neutrality, a transgender uh, fiction upon real uh, and essential differences. Justice is really about how do we cater for those differences such that people don't pay a price for them. So if you look at something like the... So, so, oh, OK, I'll probably end. I think Sorry. you've got the general drift. Um, uh, I think uh, the audience <laughs> is probably sufficiently provoked at yes. this point uh, <laughs> by a few things. Um, Elif Sarikan, uh, does the patriarchy exist? I mean, firstly, wow. <laughs> um, I like that. I, on, I personally, uh, and I'm taking my jacket off for this, I personally find the question of whether patriarchy exists or not quite insulting. Firstly, because, I mean, I come from, so I'm Kurdish, uh, as um, was said in the introduction. I come from the place where, uh, you know, according to the historical references we have, is the birthplace of patriarchy, you know, from the beginning of the Sumerian state um, and, and so on. So where I come from, we know very well the effects of patriarchy. Now, I know the... I know the, the distinction is between being made um, in some of the friends who are s speaking here between wh whether it did exist and does it still exist or not. But I think, you know, when we talk about a quote unquote vilifying of, you know, a group of people, of course that shouldn't happen. But I think there's a difference between pointing out privilege and vilification. And I think if we start equating to the two with each other, I think we that's when we get into dangerous territory. And I think, again, it's quite a historical injustice to call pointing out, you know, white male privilege, equating that to fascism. Fascism has caused the death of millions of people. I haven't seen the, whether if it is the vilification or pointing out privilege, I haven't seen that cause the mass genocide of white men just yet. And I hope obviously it never happens. But, you know, so I think, when, when we talk about the patriarchy, we're, we're, we're not just talking about individual men, of course. It's not like, obviously, there's, there's about, you know, four billion men on, in the world. It doesn't mean, you know, four billion men are all, are all patriarchs. Of course, that it doesn't mean that. Patriarchy is about a system of dominance. It's a structure of dominance, and therefore, it's a system that is built around particular ideas that still exist. And, you know, I know, again, the distinction is made between the West and, and the non-West. Um, again, as though w us in the West are always uh, more further ahead. 
um, and progressive than the non-West, which obviously is just factually incorrect. And, you know, we need to understand that. But even in the West, if we still have the question of the control over women's bodies being discussed, that's a structure of patriarchy. If the discussion of women, whether women should be able to have the right to be able to abort or terminate a pregnancy or not is still being discussed, that is a structure of patriarchy by definition because it's, it's dominance over women's bodies in that sense. And you know, when we talk about, you know, I think potentially Joanne has a very specific experience in life in general, and I can't say much to that experience, obviously, because I, I simply don't have that experience. But I think we really need to be able to understand that sometimes it's not that our experience is the majority, but in fact, it's the minority experience in a sense where, you know, most, most people, you know, individual women may be in very high, uh, positions in other, you know, certain job sectors or or so on, and as um, Philip said, you know, parts of society, especially if you're middle or middle class or above. But I think, you know, there's women who, and I'm sure in this room, who are still getting paid less for doing the exact same job um, and having the exact same qualification for with their male colleagues. This is a system of patriarchy, and it doesn't mean there's these like evil like older white men in a room like uh, you know plotting these all the time obviously not but it is a system that came about through men and men and male dominance building this now and ag again of course there's women who are patriarchs as well because this isn't like i said this is more of a system and a mentality than a gender or a sex issue perhaps now but i guess you know we can talk about you know, because uh, you wanted to ask about the specific experience, so I'll, I guess no, I'll... No, 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 that, I'll, I'll open yeah. remarks, and I think there are about 10 or 12 things we could follow up sure. from what you've just said. Um, but I think there may be a problem here um, in that, um, you know, we, we seem to be generalising about humanity as a whole, and then we're dealing with so many different parts of the world when so many different things apply. We haven't talked, we talked about essentially a non-secular world, we haven't talked about the patriarchies that may or may not exist within more uh, religiously inclined societies and so on. For the purpose of this first part of the discussion, can we focus on what we might call, well, this country? And then I would like to talk to you specifically a little bit later about your experience in the Middle East. But let's just focus in this country. So are we talking about here? We're talking essentially, when we talk about patriarchy, we're talking about power and more power automatically being given to men because <laughs> of their sex than anything else. And you would argue would you, for a lot of people, that this is still, we may be, may be making moves forwards away from that society, but we are still broadly a patriarchal society. I think that would be, now Philip, you challenge that. Yeah, yeah I, I think this is just nonsense, I'm afraid. Um, and in this, in this no, let me, let me speak to it. So the, um, <clears throat> the pay gap is overwhelmingly a pregnancy gap. In all the studies that's been done of gender, yeah, I, I appreciate you haven't read the literature, but I have. And 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 um, <laughs> so so in all the studies that have been done um, on the pay gap, it's overwhelmingly a pregnancy gap. Yes. Yeah, so women, why should why should, should be women? Me, no, but hold on. In which case, why should women be penalised for getting pregnant? Exactly, and that's because the feminism that we've had has been patriarchal because the type of feminism, liberal feminism that we've advanced was the feminism of autonomy that didn't recognize that women have children and also the overwhelming majority want to care for those children. And the pay gap is up to the age of 30, women with degrees have higher wages than men with degrees. That's women women, women outcompete men in all forms of education up to and including university level now. In, and the pregnancy pay gap is essentially, the pay gap is essentially because we haven't provided for women who have children at the scale needed. And when women have children, they, come, they move out of the workforce, and when they come back, they're on a non-career pathway, they're at a lower rate, and they part-time. So you describe so if a you, society which is made for so, men and so hasn't no, adjusted no, the, to the reality of no, women. What actually happened is the type of feminism that took legislative form was a patriarchal type that didn't account for, for feminists, for the difference of women and the difference of women bearing and having children. I am more feminist, I would argue, precisely because I want that to be catered for. So but the second, sorry, sorry, uh, let sorry, me go no, to the no, other No, I must pick that up. You're contradicting yourself. I doubt what you're that. saying is, I'm not a patriarch because I want to alter what is a still a patriarchal system. 
Um, so you've just acknowledged in advancing your own case that the system is still based on patriarchy. <laughs> I have said I have said that the patriarchy that has emerged is that is still dominant is primarily a possession of liberal feminism uh, because liberal feminism listen to this liberal feminism advances autonomy then the nature where women are blocked is when they are non-autonomous and the prime point when they're non-autonomous is when they have children and that was advanced by the liberal feminism that emerged in the 1960s what I'm saying is as a more radical feminist than that type of offer the great danger is liberal feminism if we really want to be radical feminists we have to cater for the difference that women have and women possess and the trouble is is most liberal feminism doesn't do this but point two point two no, no, hold on to i must hold you on this point because 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 there are too many points going by forgive me okay. what you seem to be advocating as yeah. far as i understand it is one a patriarch did exist two in our society the results of that are still evident three your solution is a different form of feminism but it doesn't deny the fact that the vestiges if you like of that patriarchy are still existing and are still pertinent and affecting people so you know right sorry <laughs> uh, two or three right Joanna um, so, um, just to come back to the points that were raised down here and some of the, the things in the audience. So, if we look at law, for example, I think law is a really good example of how far society has changed in recent years. So, 60%, 60% of lawyers are now female. Um, in Magic Circle companies, which, as you'll know, are the top, the very, very top law firms, 47 percent are female. So, gender equality. So, again, I don't have the exact statistics. Right, but is the old argument that, sorry, can I just go, is, is the argument, Joanna, there, that, the, that because the figures are so large now for the numbers of women joining the profession, you believe that it is inevitable as they move up that at the higher reaches, men will become, women will become partners and more dominant. In other words, there's a necessary time lag. I think that's definitely true. I do believe that. I think um, society's changed so quickly. And of course, as new entrants come in from the bottom up, it does begin to have a change. But then it is the case that people, women and men, don't live in the world. We don't live in gender exclusive bubbles. I don't just live with other women. I live with a partner, with my children that are both male and female. I work with male and female colleagues. We don't live in these kind of gender exclusive bubbles. In our society, we work alongside each other. We live alongside each other. And, and people in families, men and women together, do make choices about what they want to do when they have children, how they want to organize their lives now we can be critical of other people's choices often people are but we, we don't make those choices for people I'd like but to Joanna, the argument is that actually by virtue of being a woman there's only one choice or not only one choice you are more likely to have to take a certain choice than another in other words choice is theoretically there but in fact by the nature of the structure of society is far more limited for women than for men so you can make a theoretical case but in a practical case it is not the case the choices are loaded more towards men than women. You dispute that now? Well, I think actually if you work in a law firm, particularly if you work in a top law firm, if you have a decent salary as a lawyer, the choices that are available to you as a woman or as a man are way more extensive than the choices that would be available to you if you work on the checkout in a supermarket, uh, if you work as a cleaner, if you have a low wage. What empowers people to be able to make these choices in life is money, and that's the bottom line. Line. the more money you have the more ability you have to be able to say well I'll work a few days a week I'll work part-time um, you know I'll organize my life how I want to the less money you have the more difficult it is to be able to make these choices the problem is feminism by very definition forces us to see the world through gender lines to see the world as men on but one side women on the other are we not, haven't you made a pretty elitist case for university educated women with a vast range of middle-class choices not available to working plus women. Exactly. This is the problem. I would like these choices to be available to more women, uh, to, to all women, to all women and men. But I don't think we... So, so we have complete gender equality in terms of pay for people who are in minimum wage jobs. If you work in a care home, a supermarket, as a cleaner, you're going to get the minimum wage. And that minimum wage is the same whether you are a man or a woman. 
Exactly, um, and this is why I'm not advocating it at all. And this is why I'm saying that if we focus exclusively on something like the gender pay gap, then yeah, great. So Rwanda, for example, um, is fourth in the world league tables for gender equality because men and women have equally little. We can have minimum wage, zero gender pay gap. Actually, that's not great. I'd far rather live in a world where men and women earned more than the minimum wage and were able to make better life choices, different life choices, because, because they had the money and the freedom to be able to do that. When we focus myopically on gender, we do risk a race to the bottom. Elif? So, I mean, just to make clear, I have read the literature and I have analysed, especially being a part of the Kurdish women's movement, I have analysed, I have been able to read analysis, analyses of uh, 5,000 years of uh, the history of civilization. So I've read this too. Um, I've read about the Neolithic era where it was more of a, um, uh, what we could call not necessarily a matriarchy, but a, 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 uh, a women oriented society. And many of the things we take for granted actually, you know, because the discussion around, you know, uh, uh, women having children and then therefore, you know, forgetting about their careers and so on. This is an inc obviously an incredibly essentialist uh, uh, approach. And I know you're deliberately being an essentialist, you're advocating for that, and I understand that. But this is, this is what creates the division, actually. You know, we talk about feminism, and don't get me wrong, I am the radical feminism that, I don't know what radical feminism that you, you may be, uh, you may want to advocate, but I'm a part of a radical feminist movement. I'm part of the a movement that defeated uh, ISIS, women defeated ISIS, and are building in northern Syria a society that is based on direct democracy, uh, gender liberation, and uh, ecology. So this is the movement I'm part of, and it's happening. Uh, it's happening in northern Syria. It's happening in a part of the world where most people in this wow. room about 10 years ago wouldn't have... Uh, imagined it would happen, but it was able to happen because of the analysis of the reality of patriarchy and male dominance. The analysis is based on that, uh, in conjunction with class, with capitalism, with colonialism, with imperialism, and all of these intertwined. Now, again, there's obviously... So just, could you just flesh this out a little bit. Sure. So, so the decision making well, long may it continue, but the decision-making, the constitution that you agree amongst yourselves, Who's done that? And what do you say, for example, about participation? Do you have quotas? Do you have insisting everything? How do you implement so that the, in the structure of your emerging society? So the way it works is the society right now is, is organized on uh, the, you know, the foundation of it are assemblies, people's assemblies. And the way they work is every assembly has uh, a co-chair system. So there's a man and a woman who chair these assemblies and there's a minimum 40% quota for women uh, in every single level of administration and there's also autonomous women structures that have veto power over uh, any decision that is made for society and this is a, this exists again like I said because that is the, because of the very real understanding of patriarchy and how that is intertwined is it, with class. Is it also pop because in a sense you it's a revolutionary situation you have swept away, at least, you know, hopefully for a long time, what existed. So you can build from uh, virtually it's clear ground. Whereas what we're looking at yeah. is societies which are, have evolved, the ones we're in, maybe we need a revolution, in a in, in, in much more complex way over a longer period. And it's simply not possible to make the sort of break that you've made. Yeah, no, I, I mean, of course, there's a reality here. There's a fully functioning, well, in some ways functioning government. Uh, <laughs> uh, there, but there is a government, there is a state, and so there's also proposals um, and suggestions of how that can happen w within an existing stra state structure. So there's, so there's suggestions for uh, municip municipalism, which I think is, is becoming a, w a wider discussion, um, hopefully in, in our country and also other aspects of people's assemblies, um, whether it's, you know, local uh, trying to organize and somehow make use of the local power that still remains, you know, whether it's within councils or wards or, um, and so on. But I think, you know, we need, when we talk about 
patriarchy, you know, I think it's really patronizing to constantly try and use quite pseudo scientific. Uh, so-called statistics or studies. Well, it would always be wrong when to use pseudo scientific statistics. There are either the scientific statistics or not, and if they're pseudo, we don't want them. Well, so, for are sure. you suggesting that the gentleman on my left uses pseudo statistics? I don't. He may not deliberately be using them, but I think the studies right, he's which reading is pseudo? are quite. Tell me which of what is so statistics. So, I think the, especially the pre pregnancy aspect, because one, not all women actually have children. Um, two. There, there are women who just simply can't have children. Yeah, what are the you know, statistics? You made a, an allegation. I'm not talk, I don't want to talk about statistics oh, because I don't believe in statistics. Well, why did you use the expression pseudo statistics? Because then? I just think we shouldn't be making grand decisions and suggestions about systems based on uh, micro statistics. That's the point I'm trying to make, which is why I'm not trying to give an alternative statistic. I'm talking about, you know, qualitative, real life things and people around well, us and especially if we want to talk about the UK I think most of us have that well, right, let me, I must move on to the first point here so sure. we'll pick that up is uh, the question the theme about whether men have to lose out for women to gain equality and I think the implication of some things from the audience is that it men are in such a privileged position that although we have greater opportunity for women that's a long way for equality and actually it means in part men having to lose out for women to gain equality. Does anybody on the platform think that's the case? That men, in a sense, have to accept the responsibility for the past and restrict, ac accept no. restrictions in order for women to go forward? Does anybody accept that? No. Do you, no? I, I don't accept it, but I want to um, look at some things that have happened historically, which perhaps show that this is the case to some extent. So the gender pay gap, I, I do like statistics, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm not going to go into the intricacy of the gender statistics here uh, now, but, but you know I can do and I might do a little bit. Um, I think everybody in the room here, no matter whether you think the gender pay gap is at 18%, which it, that's an average, which takes all men and all women, it's not a median hourly pay gap. If you look at the median hourly, so compare um, the hourly rate and the median hourly rate, it, it comes down to 8.9%, and that's Office for National Statistics, not just me making it up. But, but I, I hope everybody in this room, whatever you think the gender pay gap might be, agrees that it has come down. So whether we think it's a huge 25% or whether we think it's a 1% or whatever, um, it has come down dramatically. But do you over think it should be eradicated? Uh, but, but the point is, we ha now have to ask, why has the gender pay gap come down? Is it because women are just doing so much better and earning so much more? Well, for some women, yes, that is the case. You know, with the expansion of higher education, we've got more women nowadays working as accountants, doctors, lawyers, vets. You know, women have really entered the professions in a way that 20, 30 years ago just was not the case. At the same time, you go up to places like Middlesbrough, where I'm from in the northeast of England, and the steelworks, the chemical plants, the jobs that traditionally men were doing that were high paid jobs, decent paid jobs, have collapsed. This is a, a long-term thing going back to the Thatcher government of the 70s and the 80s. So the gender pay gap has balanced out as well in these old industrial heartlands, um, not because women have been doing so much spectacularly better, uh, but because the no, high-paid men's jobs of mining, industry have gone. So then you open up new jobs for people, supermarkets, call centres, equally badly paid for men and women. Now, my concern with the discussion about patriarchy and feminism, um, as I've kind of the point I've been making all along really, is that by impeaching men and women against each other, as this zero-sum game, either women win and men lose, or men win and women lose, you, you stop being able to fight for what's better for everyone, sure. which would be better paid jobs, better, more industry, new economic investment, so that both men and women have the opportunity to earn more, get a better quality life for themselves. Sure. I, I profoundly agree with all that. And I think if we, if we look at... Um, the, according to the OECD, intra-country inequality is now higher than intra-country inequality. So inequalities are higher within a country than between countries, which is a remarkable change. 
and if whether we, they're men or women, or uh, just just generally. Uh, general uh, general inequality. So if you are interested in justice for all, the type of politics we have cannot deliver that. And the type of politics that we have, which is sectional politics, segregating people off and pursuing particular interests, liberal emancipatory politics do not deliver. Yeah. And if you're interested in the rise of populism and the rise of the West, it's largely a pushback against social and economic liberalism that fragments people and doesn't deliver for the bottom half, and increasingly it'll soon be the bottom 60% of society. So if you're interested in general emancipation, we need different forms and different ways to argue against discrimination. So you right. basically want socialism? Um, I want a form of collective care for everybody. And I think there's then there's legitimate difference between how we achieve that. So what I want to, to suggest to you is the way we've been trying to advance black people, gay people, women, blah, 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 is fundamentally wrong and cannot deliver on that general good. And part of what I think evinces this is if you look at the current kind of war within feminism between uh, what one might call sex and gender and, and the transsexual uh, count. Because the type of capitalism or the type of um, extreme liberalism that I think we need to oppose is the type that essentially individualizes us and strips us of our difference to such an extent that we can't cater for that difference and make that difference equal with other differences. So in gender, women are looking at the erasure of their own spaces, are looking at the erasure of the very idea of distinction, the very idea of women are essentially being removed by transsexual type arguments. So you're getting an account that wants to take the whole of women out of the equation. So you can't even have um, uh, feminism because there's no such thing as women, because, there's no, because everything is gender and everything is flux. That's why I want to argue for essentialism. And I think that what we need to recover Sorry, is a form before of you argue for it, will you explain what it is? <laughs> okay, essentialism would be something like squaring with the reality that men and women exist as distinct biological, social, cultural forms, and they really are different. And that the project of social justice, which I believe in, is about how those people don't pay a penalty for the differences they have. That's the new project, which will require, in my view, a different type of feminism than the one we currently have. I'll just finish two more minutes. Um, uh, no, no, now, sorry, no, sorry. Right, one I more minute. One more minute. Uh, one more minute. Because what we have seen, if we really care about justice, the most oppressed groups in the UK are white working class males. They are the people who pay the highest penalty. They are the people it's who progress. It's definitely migrant who, women. Who, 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 no, actually, it's not. In education. It really is. It, isn't, it really isn't. It really is. Okay. My mother's a migrant woman. I, I, right, I, know let's you agree, like, I know you argue from anecdotal positions, but actually, on, on, the, on all the evidence that's been presented, white market working class males pay the highest penalty. And here's the two indicators that determine you. The place of your birth and the level of your mother's education outcompete every other indicator for what will happen to you. That, That's class. Uh, we need a separate session on essentialism and class and whatever. And I mm. just want to, forgive me for just going back to the first theme, I want to give you one example which I think encapsulates the dilemma. When we talk about do men have to lose out for women to gain equality. You may have noticed this big row where, the, where a woman appointed as deputy editor in BBC News has refused to take up the job because she was offered a, uh, less, I think about tw initially 12,000 less, than a man the other deputy editor appointed. And lots of women in the BBC signed up in her support and it, she said, same job, same rate of pay. The problem is that the BBC doesn't have a rate of pay for a job, it has a band. And in that band, what you get paid is weighted also by the length of time you spent in the organization and to agree your age. So the man she is up against has edited a number of programs, is 58 and so on. So in order, if you take the view that that doesn't matter, it's the rate for the job, particularly with the BBC at the moment, what you'll have to do is bring the man's pay down and say there's no longer a band for a job, there's a rate. But it also means, however long you do it, however long you are to the company, you're not getting any more money because there is a rate for the job. That seems to me to encapsulate a real dilemma. And I just wanted to mention it because 
you know, the, the way it's reported is slightly different. So if you take one view, men will have to be penalised. If you take another, and the primary thing is equality of pay, the pay is the job, the pay, that determines it. You take another, it's those dilemmas that are being fought out. So I think this issue, and we see the, uh, the overall issue of women's pay at the BBC making news headlines time and time again, to me this just shows really good illustration of how middle class feminism is. If you work in McDonald's and you go for a job interview in McDonald's and you say, oh I'd like to negotiate my salary please and um, I'd like my experience and I'd like my uh, reputation to be taken into account, they laugh at you, they say there's the door, we'll get somebody else, thank you. If you're a teacher even, which is a fair middle class job if you're a teacher and you say I'd like to negotiate my salary I'd like this and this to be taken into account they say no this is the pay scale this is what you get we've had equal pay legislation in this country about same job uh, same pay uh, for many well, decades since the mid 1970s and any woman sitting in this room now if you think that you are doing the exact same job at the exact same level for the exact same number of hours each week as a man and are being paid differently you need to seek legal redress that's really important important because your your employer is breaking the law and you should go and get legal redress and I will help you if you know make this offer available I will do my best to help you however when it comes to the BBC uh, Hollywood um, advertising some of these industries that very few people work in where where honestly I look at them and their salaries to me look like telephone numbers it's a salary which is way beyond my wildest imaginings and the wildest imaginings of everybody I know in my family. I'll, I'll just take a 20% pay cut. Big <laughs> then, the you know, I'm sorry, but my heart doesn't really bleed. No. And their salaries are not based on um, the same rate, the same way in which my salary is negotiated. It's their reputation, their ability to pull in an audience, their experience, well, often you're through you're negotiators, through agents, yeah, and they need to get a better agent. Yeah, but I think you're mistaking performance as opposed to producers and others because the BBC pay levels generally have come for ordinary right down. And what's happened with the fragmentation of the industry is that particularly, and it tends to be in radio, a lot of women are in short-term contracts, the salaries haven't gone up, it's casualisation, they haven't been paid for a long time. But no man, that's the side. Can we, I just wanted to get the second theme here, which is, are there arenas where equality is a mistaken goal and women should have the upper hand? Let me ask the provocative question, which is, uh, I suppose on this, is it the case that women have to be or should be, or we should assume they should have the primary rights when it comes to children. We've heard the assertion here in terms of abortion that essentially in this, on an issue of life like that it is a woman's decision. Do you extend that into life itself and do we say outside of business there is a fundamental if you like uh, area where equality is mistaken because women should be given primacy in terms of children and child care. Not that they must <laughs> but that's a fundamental assumption. They should have that right. Do you have any, um, any sympathy for that perspective? I mean, I think th this question is very intertwined with like the previous question as well in terms of do men have to lose out for women to be equal? I think, I don't think it's that different. I mean, my short answer would be no. You know, I think in, in, the, in the case of a child, a custody situation, you know, I think that's one of the one of the arenas where the individual case is really important because it doesn't mean just because you're a woman, you're just naturally going to be a great mother, right? No, so, but assuming not breakups, let's look at families that stay together. Should it be assumed that in that power structure, the woman should be the dominant figure when it comes to the upbringing of children, those decisions? I, I certainly don't think so. So you, believe, you would argue for equality in that? Yeah, I think so too. And I, I think I, that's pretty important. Uh, but, but, but you don't do it on abortion, even though there but is another life involved. But that's because involved. that's the woman individually herself carrying that. Yeah, they the don't share like role, four and a half but, months each. But the, man has had, <laughs> but, yeah. the, but the man has had a role and the child has an independent life. I'm not sure that, not say women, this is a separate argument, should have the dominant view, but are you arguing exclusively? Uh, about abortion? Yeah. You know, yeah, for sure. Right, okay. I think there's cases, but can I just make this point? I think there's cases, of course, you know, if you're, if you have a partner, if you're, I think, yeah, I think most of the time, it, it, you know, it usually is a mutual decision. But I think the ultimate decision to, 
terminate literally growing life within you should be up to the person but carrying let's get back, sorry, slight sidetrack, forgive me, I, I went on the sidetrack. On the question of, of upbringing of children, uh, should we accept that women should have the, the, the dominant decision-making role? Not that they shouldn't share the work, if you like, but the decision-making should be predominantly the woman. I mean, I, I think that's entirely down to individual families in their own situations. I mean, I'll be perfectly honest, I've got three children. Um, I would not be sat here today if my husband wasn't at home looking after them. Um, you know, and, and that's not something, we don't sit down and bring out a spreadsheet and say, well, you know, I've had five days this week, you know, me looking after them, so you've got five days next week. You just negotiate things as you go along. I don't know any family where they bring out a spreadsheet and people tally but, up hours. But some people would say there is a naturally stronger in the early years relationship between a mother and yeah. the children I, I mean, than I, I'm with that. and that in those circumstances the woman no. not has to but we should expect the woman to take a lead, more leading role perhaps later on the balance changes is that something you I, I don't think that and maybe I'm just revealing my own terrible motherhood here but I think I'm really with Elif on this um, you know when I had children I don't think a kind of magic maternal instinct clicked in my brain immediately not to say I don't love my children if they're watching a recording of this I love them very much indeed but it's not like you know hormonally um, I have some different chemical structure in my body that makes me naturally superior as a parent to my husband. In many ways, I think he's a better parent than I am in relation to our children. Um, I think uh, you know, society does put women into that position. Uh, so for example, uh, if my children are ill at school, if our children are ill at school, it will often be the case that the school phones me up and I'll laugh and I'll say, well, I'm sorry, I'm 200 miles away. Have you thought of phoning my husband up who happens to be at home? But I think more and more this is the case um, now again sorry to bring it back to statistics but there is no huge gap um, in men and women being employed outside of the home it's pretty damn near equal between the numbers of women and men who have jobs so the idea that the school would phone up women to say you Can know your child is no, no, before you do can we apologize for not pursuing the very large number of other issues that came out here apologize that we haven't got more time <laughs> But I'd like on your behalf to thank the panellists for not holding back in any way. Thank you very much. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.